Right now, there are no topics more important than resiliency and decarbonization. We're already seeing the effects of climate change all over the world. We've got massive wildfires out west. We've got monster storms hitting the southeast and a record hurricane season year after year. We've got extreme temperatures. Places like Arizona are becoming almost unlivable at certain times of the year. We've got crazy power outages in weird places like Texas. Who would have believed that Texas would have a multi-day power outage and a freeze? Today, I'm joined by Dexter Gauntlet and Mukesh Sethi. These guys are experts on solar power, storage, and electric vehicle fleets with Panasonic. Welcome, guys. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Great. Thank you. Great to be here. Good to see you, Dexter. Before we zero in on the home solar application, which I know everybody wants to hear about, let's pull way back and look at the big picture. Now, Dexter, you've been working with utilities. Now, that's got to be interesting. Um, how are utilities approaching this decarbonization challenge? I mean, don't they have to compete? completely rework the way they do business and get rid of their old business models? Well, the good news is that about 200 utilities around the U.S., from municipal-owned utilities to investor-owned utilities, munis, cooperatives, have a 100% carbon reduction target. So that's awesome. But a lot of those targets are set for the 2040 to 2050 timeframe. On the good side, that fortunately a lot of those carbon uh, reduction and renewable energy targets are actually being accelerated as the cost of batteries and solar continue to come down. Okay, so let me stop for a second. So they're speeding up, but what's going to be the impact for the average utility end user like me? Yeah, so as part of that transition to 80%, 100% clean energy over the next 10, 15 years, what we're going to see is a growing percentage of that power and the um, ability for homeowners who want batteries are going to play a bigger role uh, with the grid. Now, what that means is that if you're a homeowner or a business or a big corporate, you are going to have more options uh, offered to you uh, from your utility that enable you to effectively participate more in uh, stabilizing the grid, maintaining re reliability, and being compensated for when the utility gets to use your assets. It requires a fundamental change in how utilities have historically managed the grid and their relationship with customers. And that's really what our Panasonic utility advisory team has really been working on. We're helping utilities develop these new strategies, uh, ideate on the business models, do the financial modeling, making sure that customers are squarely at the center of their offerings. Um, and that ranges from everything, from solar to batteries to electric vehicle fleets, all of those kind of things that will help the utilities realize their transformation at, uh, um, ambitions. That's cool. So, okay, so let's let's look at a real world scenario. I, I mentioned that big freeze that happened in Texas last year. People lost powers for days on end. Pipes exploded in people's houses and then froze over. Um, is this future scenario you're talking about with utilities and small uh, renewable power production at home working together, is that going to do anything to help prevent scenarios like that? Yeah, I mean, that's the idea. Um, as climate change really wreaks increasing havoc on our lives, um, on um, a more powerful storms, hurricanes, um, what we're going to see is utilities responding very proactively. Now, you mentioned also, um, we were talking in an earlier call, you, you talked about how software and hardware are becoming separate entities and sort of Panasonic sort of getting in on the software side, right, of, of utilities. Now, somebody's still got to make the wires, maintain the wires. When a transformer blows up on my street, somebody's got to come in and replace it or, or maintain it. So how is that going to work? Who's going to take over the hardware responsibility? From a top-down approach, we get to work with utilities who want to uh, proactively address this, to get ahead of the curve. So we're providing them with the software tools they need to manage uh, distributed energy resources, particularly uh, with large fleets. So as Amazon, UPS, big corporates start to electrify their fleet, utilities need to be able to manage the grid. And that's what our team is working on right now the most. Now, on the other side, from a bottoms up approach, you have real innovators like Mukesh and his team at Evervolt who are 
designing grid-enabled products. So that will maximize, of course, the resiliency and the cost effectiveness and all those kind of elements, but also um, enable the utility to actually use their uh, solar and storage as a grid resource so that the homeowner can be compensated during certain times where the grid needs it. Okay, so I was gonna ask you, so when they borrow power, say you've got a, your electric vehicle plugged in at your house and the utility borrows some power, they're actually paying you for that power. They're not, they're not stealing it from you essentially. Uh, right, right. There's all sorts of different flavors of that. You've got net metering, you've got demand response programs, you've got these kind of resiliency as a service programs that are launching. So again, yes, in all cases, the customer is actually pretty set up to be compensated pretty nicely for these things. And also uh, the electric vehicles, right? There seems like there's an awful lot of, of thought and money behind the electrical vehicle transition or the effort to get us into an EV transition. Is that gonna be a, a friend or a foe to the transition to utilities modernizing? Great question. That is squarely the next frontier and that what our team has really worked on here. Uh, what we're seeing around the country are uh, transition, not only the light duty vehicle, so your Tesla and all these, but the next level is really the medium and heavy duty fleets. When you think about what it actually looks like at the grid from 100, 200, 300, 500 vehicles charging at what time of day, um, how to optimize to avoid getting very large demand charges, that's the software that Panasonic is building for utilities to be able to manage that for their customers cost effectively. So it's a whole different way of managing electricity, essentially. And the benefit of all this is as more vehicles electrify, it actually has a um, reduction, uh, it relieves pressure on rates. So as more vehicles electrify, there's um, more electrons on the grid that are spread out a large, among a larger customer base. That will help to actually keep rates low. Let's hope we keep going that direction. All right, guys, I have heard this term, which frankly, I have no research on it. I'm not sure what it means. Virtual power plant. Fill me in. Uh, all right, Mukesh, maybe I'll go first and you can um, add on to this one as you see fit. So uh, our industry definitely loves buzzwords. And uh, virtual power plant, as you've honed in on, is definitely uh, the latest and greatest in that. Uh, at a high level, what it refers to is a um, system where instead of a historically, you know, big central coal plant, gas plant, now renewables, um, out, you know, far from the city, uh, generating power, sending it to uh, the load centers and cities, etc. cetera. Um, that's kind of the old paradigm. Uh, in the new paradigm, in the future vision, of which we're on maybe 10, 20, 30 year um, trajectory to actually realize, though we are seeing small bits of it, is a more decentralized world as we discussed earlier. Meaning that this concept of the prosumer where they can bring your own device, meaning uh, battery, solar, electric vehicle, that those all become basically nodes uh, on the grid. And each of those nodes uh, has a contractual relationship with their utility uh, to be able to participate in the electric grid, meaning they can sell energy, they can sell capacity, they can um, decide to island from the grid and power themselves. But at the same time, uh, you need a, an orchestrator of all of those different nodes that not only is limited to the distributed systems, but also interacts with the existing wholesale markets. So that concept of taking the big central legacy um, you know, uh, system and combining it with the distributed system in a way that works both technically and contractually is really the essence of the virtual power plant. Mukesh, what do you think? Yeah, so I think Dexter, you explained it very well. So in our case, you know, the main thing is there's a hardware which is, can only be used in, in the household. But if you want to be part of the virtual power plant kind of thing where you can sell your energy to the grid, to the utility company or to a wholesale market, you need to have a very good software system which is interacting with the utilities and all the aggregators which are there trying to like give you the direction when they need the power and how much and you can be very well incentivized to dump your power to back to the grid whenever they need it. So it's pretty simple. Uh, all you need 
to do is make sure you have the right product, which can, which has the capability to you know interact with these aggregators and you know can communicate. Your system can communicate with it and can do whatever is needed to be done, and you can get compensated with it. So that's basically virtual power plant. I think there's a lot of potential here because one of the biggest problems we have in the green business, right, trying to convince people to be more sustainable, to, to use more efficient stuff, is just getting them to uh, care, right? And one of the ways that we get them to care is things like game theory. It's, it's like those drivers who try to use as little gas as possible and it becomes a competition. Maybe there's something in here where essentially, you know, you can have utilities or, or, or even small virtual plants competing to be the most efficient. You got it. I mean, that is 100% the vision. And it's just a matter of can utilities align sufficiently with uh, what their core mandate is, is, which is provide, you know, cost effective, reliable power. Um, but let's also take into account that the consumer is really has to be front and center. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's very, it's very promising though, and it, it is the natural direction things are moving. Um, so that's a good segue into uh, talking with you, Mukesh. Um, your ex area of expertise is really uh, homeowners, where the residential market's going, um, putting solar and storage into homes, what's the right amount, what's the right fit, um, we've talked about in the past, Panasonic's got a kind of a different approach to solar and storage than some of the other companies. What's the difference? Not just the solar panels, Matt, we are focusing on this entire total home energy solution system, which consists of solar panels, battery storage, inverters, and all the electronics which goes with it. So we have basically, you know, changed our approach from a product company to a system solution based company. So we have one stop shop for the homeowner where we can sell the entire system and which works seamlessly with, you know, all the components work seamlessly, have its one software, one app and one under one umbrella, under one company and uh, one warranty. So that's what our approach is. Now, uh, in the past, the, the storage aspect of solar has, has moved a lot more slow, slowly, right? I mean, it's a, it's a large added expense. You're almost doubling the cost of just a grid connected panel system. But uh, when I talked to you a few days ago, you said that storage is actually climbing quite rapidly now. What, what's behind the surge in people's interest in storing electricity? The need for resiliency has become very important than ever before. And the storage attachment rates we have seen has increased quite a bit now because people are getting ready for resiliency. You know, people are ready for time of use where the demand rates are high at certain times of the day and certain utilities are getting away from that metering. So as we see all these things changing, you know, the attachment rates of solar is getting more and more higher with solar. But Different uh, families have different requirements. Uh, all depends on what their requirements are. If they don't need the air conditioning, if they just have lighter loads like lights, fans, refrigerator, you know, it's maybe a small sump pump, a microwave, a toaster oven. But if you need the air conditioning to be on as well, like a central air conditioning, which are heavier loads or a valve pump, then you need to go even higher. That's cool. Now, now tied in with that, uh, there's some technical language, which I wonder if you could clarify for me. What's the difference? between AC and DC coupling, and it is one better than the other, and why? So basically what AC coupling means is, AC coupling is actually ideal for a retrofitting a storage on top of an existing solar system. So if the solar inverter is already present and you want to add storage, then obviously you need an AC coupled system. You cannot have a system which can work with an existing solar system if it's DC coupled. It can save a lot of money in, uh, in a lot of extra power electronics and devices and minimize the cost. So it gives a lot of flexibility that way. Now, what does it mean that, that I read that that inverter is outdoor rated? It has a lot of advantages. One thing you already, you already talked about is a hybrid inverter. So it can go with existing system as well as a new system. Uh, it is a bit bigger size. So it can go for 7.6 kilowatt hour off grid. Uh, and up to nine kilowatt hour with the grid, which means like you can run heavy loads as well, and you can max out your storage uh, in outage, or if, even if you're using for time of use modes, you don't have to draw power from the grid because the inverter can support pretty much your house loads, so you can save a lot of money there. Uh, it can take up to 12 kilowatt of PV, which means you know the PV input means the solar system input 
you can have as big as 12 kilowatt hour, which is 12 kilowatt, which is pretty big size PV system. And the, the storage capacity is, you know, 15 and a half kilowatt hour in one system. So it can be expandable to 31 kilowatt hour uh, total in one, just in single system. And it can be stacked up to three systems. So it can really increase the size and as the needs increases. Panasonic's done some, some interesting stuff with batteries. I know you, uh, in your Evervolt system, is sort of modular, so you don't have to, you know, use a forklift to bring the thing into your garage or basement. Essentially, you can bring them in in modules, and then if you have to repair them, you can basically haul them out in smaller pieces, so they're more easy to get at. And just two people can do the install in around three to four hours. So it's pretty, you know, you know good for installation purposes as well. Now, I know, um, you know, one of the problems with, with certain types of batteries is you have to watch how much you discharge them. Now, these are what they call LFP battery systems. The good thing about these LFP batteries is they have a higher lifespan, which means it can be cycled more. Okay, that's a big plus. Also, they're safer. Uh, they, don't, they have a higher ambient temperature range, so that's a big benefit. Is that they have a higher charge and discharge rates because of the chemistry and they have better th thermal runway thresholds, which means it won't get too hot. So a lot of advantages which come with these LFP batteries. Uh, let, me, let me throw one more question in there uh, with storage. I know that part of the challenge with storage is deciding which storage company to go with, right? You, you've got several manufacturers who've been, who offer storage. Why would somebody look at Evervolt versus uh, one of your competitors? So I would say that First of all, you, I mean, something the homeowner should look at which can take care of the demands and save them cost, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. So, and having a system which is from one company, not just the storage, but also solar panels and also all the other devices which goes into it is the best strategy. You don't want to have five different brands. You can have one application, one mobile app. You can monitor everything from that. And if a warranty claim or issue comes, you can have one company to reach out to. And you want to have a company which has been in business for long, has the experience, has the bankability behind it. Because this, this kind of solar system has a 25 year warranty and storage has a minimum 10 year warranty. So that's a long time for you know, a lot of companies to be around. And you want to invest money in a company which will be around for that long. Anyway, let's wrap it up. Um, can I ask each of you to give me sort of a one sentence phrase that summarizes Panasonic's strategy and ambitions with regard to solar, storage, and utilities? Where are we going? Let's start. Mukesh, why don't you take the first stab at it? I would say Panasonic is over a hundred year old company uh, with a 90 years more experience in producing batteries and more than 25 years of experience in rooftop solar panels. Our goal uh, is to provide a total home energy system for homeowners, which not only works seamlessly, but also gives peace of mind of owning a product from an experienced and bankable company, which will be there to support their needs and be, stand behind the warranty in the long run. That's, that's great uh, to hear because, I mean, honestly, it is, I think, one of the fears with because solar is so new uh, that we've all been burned by you know companies that aren't around long enough, and we go out and we buy some innovative product, and then we can't find anyone to repair it. So uh, that, that's a great point about the longevity. So Dexter, um, what's your take on that? I say on our side, uh, the Panasonic uh, Next Lab utility team that I'm a part of, I'd say that we specialize in helping utilities plan, procure clean, resilient, flexible energy uh, systems and programs to enable really the benefits of electric vehicles to solar and storage in the home, in the business, and in the workplace. It's good to be uh, working with the good guys. And I, I sort of feel like uh, you must feel the same way. It's like, it's nice to be um, in this time of, of world, um, you know, change and anxiety to be in the business of figuring out how to convert our energy to a renewable, clean form of energy. Well, thank you guys. That was a great talk. And uh, I look forward to uh, working with you and seeing what you come up with over the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, thank you man. Thanks, Dexter.